I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As you all can see, this is a different format than we do every week. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce, the Government Affairs Committee, is running debates this week and next week for supervisor races. So it's my honor to introduce Richard Hall, who's the chairman of that committee, and he'll be running the debate today. Great. So he'll give us the rules and, and everything else. And I can actually sit in the seat. Oh. <laughs> but Steve plays an important role today being the timer. So he's, now, uh, Steve, did you pick up a card? Since we don't have time, uh, cards with numbers on them, he's going to flash a three by five card for you, and so that means you get ten seconds left. So, um, so I'd like to actually just introduce the members of the Government Affairs Committee, Economic Development Committee. If you're here, please stand up. Uh, Bill and Andy is here, and uh, so, and Monique, wherever you may be. Okay, and Monique is the one who's collecting the cards. So, if you have a question. Uh, for one of the candidates, please write it on the three by five card, which is in the back of the room, and give it to Monique, and uh, we will uh, have Monique uh, go through those cards and make sure we don't have duplicates and, and go on with that. Um, I want to talk just a minute about the chamber's endorsement process. Uh, the chamber endorses candidates uh, for office in in uh, uh, part nonpartisan offices in the past. This year, we're going to even venture into some partisan offices, but our evaluation. An endorsement has nothing to do with general qualifications or uh, general elements of that particular candidate. It has to do with business friendliness. We represent the members of the business community and we want to make sure that uh, candidates are, are business friendly. So our uh, process is to either give them a thumbs up, a neutral, or a thumbs down, depending upon their responses to a variety of things. One is we've sent out a questionnaire which each of the candidates has uh, responded to, uh, and it gives us uh, a, a, a background. We've asked them lots of questions about uh, uh, business interests, and then uh, we also conduct an interview uh, with them uh, uh, shortly, actually, and then this public forum where they have an opportunity to uh, sort of expose their, their thoughts and, and beliefs uh, to the general public. And once that process is complete, then the Government Affairs Committee will make a recommendation to the General Board of uh, the Chamber, and the Chamber will vote to uh, endorse candidates. So that's our process. Any questions about how that works? Okay, so the ground rules for today's debate are uh, we have a two-minute opening, and the candidates have already uh, flipped coins, uh, and so uh, uh, Ms. Montgomery is going to go first, um, and uh, we'll start in just a moment. We'll, then we have the they'll have one minute for closing at the end of the session, and then uh, the questions are going to be uh, one minute each candidate. So it is meant to be a debate uh, as opposed to a public forum or a statement or whatever, and the, the essence of a debate is where candidates can in fact interact or respond to one another. And so uh, we're allowing each candidate one minute to respond to a question, uh, and then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, if it, it feels like we need to have a little bit more time on a given question, we will extend that. Um, and that's the, the general rules. General rules of decorum apply here, uh, although we're, we're not going to take our lead from the presidential debates and have people attacking one another. Um, we'll probably be a little bit more civil, but that's what our uh, approach is today. Um, without any further ado, uh, Monique, you want to bring up questions? And while you do, uh, I've got the uh, first question while we're going through this. And the, the first question is that there's a proposal for a half cent tax increase to finance. Hmm? I was supposed to introduce for two minutes. Yeah. Oh, you are supposed to introduce for two minutes. <laughs> oh, I just got over, over <laughs> ambitious. Thank you. Thank you. You should what? let him finish the question, then remind no, me. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want you to give an opportunity. Okay. With all due respect. So yes, we're, we're yes please. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to say, you know, a little bit short. <laughs> thank you all for having me here today, and thank you for having me here every Tuesday. Over the past four years, Placer County has done a great deal of very important things and had many accomplishments in the 50s and throughout the county. We've proactively begun addressing the growing national problem of homelessness at the local level. We've started planning for a modern crime and forensics lab. We've made great strides toward more fire-safe wildlands and protection of our watersheds. 
And we've also approved a number of residential and commercial projects that will stimulate economic development throughout the county. To make certain our projects and developments are consistent and aligned with the cities of Colfax and Auburn, I meet regularly with members of those city councils. All the while, we've maintained critical infrastructure while improving recreational amenities in our many communities. However, there is still much work to be done. And the next four years will be focused on identifying affordable workforce housing, providing more robust drug, alcohol, and mental health services to help keep people from falling into homelessness. I will continue to work on defensible space projects uh, by working with state, federal, and local partners to restore our forests and watersheds. And the county will continue to focus on expanding educational opportunities that will allow our children to live, work, play, and remain living, working, and playing in Placer County after they get through a four or postgraduate set of educational opportunities. As always, I will focus on continuing robust, sustainable, reliable public safety services while continuing Placer County's strong record of balanced budgets and fiscal stability. I welcome your questions and comments today and in the next four years. <laughs> well, I was going to sit down, <coughs> but there's a few people that I can't see, so I have to move around a little bit. Um, I, I'm just, as I look around the room, I just wonder what motivates us to assemble this morning? You know, we're coming from all kinds of locations. Some of you have traveled quite a distance, as a matter of fact. Um, some of you, this is just routine, getting up at 4 or 5 in the morning with the roosters. But, uh, I just, uh, you know, we're, we're really here for a common cause. Uh, there are a lot of people, let's be honest, that, that aren't here, they're not engaged and such. But uh, it is for all of them, for all 75 plus thousand people that are in the district that we're here, uh, not just for our own personal motives. I'm here, I uh, raised my family and Placer, uh, my children, Joshua and Aaron, uh, graduated from Placer High School. And again, like many of you, we're concerned about the future and, and the direction and where we're headed uh, and, as a nation, as a state, and as, as a county. Uh, I think in that we all share the same, at least we're on the same side of the fence, that we are concerned about where this is going. It's not about egos. There are always going to be issues to discuss, but it's where you're coming from. Uh, you know, I feel that we chose Placer, we chose Auburn area to live in. In fact, my daughter and I, just this year, I'm going to brag just a little bit, we skied all 15, finally, uh, ski resorts around Lake Tahoe, including Kirkwood, so that's a heck of a bucket list. So we really enjoy our backyard, Tahoe area, greater Auburn area, and in terms of addressing the issues moving forward then, what I offer you is leadership from three different sectors, from U.S. Army, uh, military, active and preserve time, business, where we have a cancer vaccine and, and human trials, and in the academic sectors where I'm a professor. And what do they have in common? They're all servanthood, they're all looking forward to taking care of the next generation, students, businesses, taking care of the community, and military. With that in mind, I offer that up for the next four years. Thank you. I can get back on course before I went off. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask the first question, and then I'll uh, go through these others with you. Uh, and that is that there is a uh, proposal for a half cent tax increase for road improvements by the Placer County Transportation Agency. Uh, would you uh, address your position uh, with that, please? And uh, shall we start with Supervisor Montgomery? I think it's premature to actually take any position on it. Uh, it appears at this point that uh, there are some real benefits for South Placer County. Uh, but I think, honestly, until the benefits for Auburn and for the 5th District are much more clearly defined, uh, it would be very difficult to say, yes, I support it, or no, I oppose it. I, I think there is a possibility that it would be very good for the area. There are, however, whether we pass that measure or not, unmet needs currently that we do need to focus on. I've had some discussions with my counterparts at the City Council about Highway 49 
and the improvements that we need to work together on with Caltrans to make sure that that uh, highway is made safer from Auburn all the way to the Nevada County line. So there's room for improvement. Yes, on, on the, the initial point, I certainly agree that it's a little bit premature because if you look at what's already written down in, in the plans, a lot of the money is going out of our district, uh, to District 5. So that's the one we have to defend. Uh, so a lot of that money is already earmarked away from us. That's, that's not to say it, it shouldn't be passed necessarily because uh, it's the total economy that's going to help, help all the districts. I think the other thing that I would take a little bit further is we need to look at the budget a little differently as well and closely and say, well, why is it always we keep going to the well? At some point, you need to just draw the line and say, and re-look at where the dollars are going in the budget. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is perhaps not quite as specific as, as we might want, but it's what is your stand on term limits? I don't know whether it's referring to term limits for uh, supervisory roles or for uh, other offices. And, and Mr. Bamich? Well, I, I normally wouldn't be a proponent. The answer is I'm a proponent. It's going to be political. It's going to kind of answer both ways. <laughs> yes, on board term limits. That's the blanket answer. Uh, it's a shame I have to be because the way the framers even intended for our, our, our country it was because we're supposed to have an educated electorate who are voting, and if somebody's good enough or things are working, they can stay in the job. And if not, we can fire them. Uh, we, they had no idea of envisioning what television and radio and marketing and media and, and smartphones, etc., and, and now Twitter and, and Facebook and such, how can influence the electorate. You go around and you survey uh, what they know about voting, those that do show up, and it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's disheartening. So I think term limits is, is the way to go for now, and that way we don't have people literally tenured into position. And it's very hard, as you know, to uh, pull out an uh, to, to I'm like exchange an incumbent. <laughs> Unlike professors that get tenured. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not for that either. <laughs> <laughs> Different form of term limits. <laughs> just thought I'd answer that. <laughs> no, very smart uh, So I think ter term limits are a double-edged sword, certainly. They make a great deal of sense, I think, from the perspective that it is difficult to uh, vote out an incumbent. The power of incumbency can't be understated. Uh, or can be overstated, excuse me. Uh, however, what I have seen in the seven years I've been with the county is we make great strides in educating our state legislators specifically on issues that are critically important to us and then they get turned out and we have to go through that educational process all over again just to get that new representative back up to speed to be able to engage in conversations for example, the benefit the chamber, and and that's very disappointing. <coughs> it's a uh, frankly like being on that you know hamster wheel, and we just there's better ways to do it. Um, the Chamber recently conducted a uh, survey of businesses in the area, and overwhelmingly one of the issues that was raised was that of homelessness. Uh, it's a pervasive and a complicated issue uh, at best, and the question now is. Should the homeless shelter in Placer County be permanent? I will start with that one. Please. Certainly a homeless shelter in Placer County should be permanent. Uh, the, the homeless shelter that we currently have out at the DeWitt Center is not intended to be a permanent facility, nor should it be. We, we recognize, all five of us on the Board of Supervisors, that it's not a spot for a permanent homeless shelter. Uh, we did all endorse the findings of Dr. Marvin's study, which said that we do need permanent shelters throughout Placer County. Notice he said shelters, uh, South Placer, somewhere in the greater Auburn area, and, and quite possibly one in eastern Placer as well, where we also have problems with homelessness. So yes, we do need a permanent shelter or shelters in Placer County, not at DeWitt. Well, that report was issued a year ago this month. And here we are a year later, still spending $45,000 a month on the shelter. Uh, there's something wrong with this picture. We need to certainly move forward. And we need to, uh, we paid good money for that study. <clears throat> and I'm glad that some of the suggestions are being taken into consideration. We certainly need to address other things, such as uh, how to treat them, mental illness, uh, uh, drug treatment, etc. And about a third of them have each, each one of those issues. And about a third are actually working. 
know, they just don't have the wages sufficient to, to get into a home. So we need to look at the whole picture for sure, but in the end, the ultimate goal is you're not going to get rid of all of them, you know, the homeless. There's no way that's going to happen. Even Jesus said the pool you'll have with you always. That's not to mean to neglect them. But what we have to do is get it to where it's a workable and a smaller population that's contributing to our society. Um, just a refresher, uh, if you have questions, there are three by five cards in the back. Uh, Mooney Call is collecting those. Um, this is more of a city question, but we'll ask it anyway. How do you feel about annexation? Well, first of all, I know there are a lot of people pushing for that, and I would be the one that would be annexing. <coughs> I don't like people annexing me. <laughs> That said, uh, if, if we have the county take, do, doing the right business, we don't need the annexation. I think Offer needs us more than, more than we would need them at, at some point as far as that in the county. Um, it's going to sound like a, a, a Board of Supervisors mantra. We need to do another study on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of annexation, I think one of the reasons that there has been a push recently for annexation is that there has been dissatisfaction with the relationship between the city and the county. And one of the things that I've really been focusing on uh, is making sure that we re-establish those connections between the city and the county to make sure that our policies and our projects are in alignment. And I think once that relationship is mended, once we have clear direction on how we move forward into the future as partners, I think that move towards annexation will dissolve under its own weight. How would you deal with the traffic congestion and parking problems at Eden <coughs> Falls Park, Lake Clementine, and uh, the river? I think I start on that one. Yes, you Excellent. Uh, well, I think the good news is Placer County took some very proactive uh, efforts toward dealing with those issues uh, at two board meetings ago. Uh, as everyone knows, Hidden Falls has become almost a victim of its own success. Even on weekdays, the parking lot is full and, in fact, over full. There's been parking along the uh, neighboring roads. And just recently, uh, we took an action that prohibited parking on some of those neighboring roads because, frankly, of public safety concerns. Uh, certainly in the case of Mears Place and Mears Road, it's very difficult at times for uh, emergency response to get to the area. Same thing with Lake Clementine, particularly in some hairpin turns. So uh, the county's taken some action on that. We've also recently taken action on similar issues at Speedboat Beach in Lake Tahoe. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think it is a, a wonderful and glorious thing that we have such a problem because we do have a lot to offer. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful community, that's why we're all here. We love it. Uh, let's use Hidden Falls as one of the examples. That's been in the news recently. I mean, there's a lot of parking issues there. I totally agree that we need to protect the private property rights and, and parking in front of there and, and, and make sure that they, that doesn't happen. You look at Muir Woods, they have about 150 parking spaces. We have about 75 at, at Hidden Falls, using that as an example to answer the question. Um, there's, it, it, and how does Muir Woods handle it? I mean, you've got uh, transportation, public transportation, uh, for fee, so we could look at that. Park and ride in the weekends is pretty much empty, so there are a lot of places we could put people up here, uh, at least on the weekends for that. And how about even putting up a webcam? A lot of people these days actually go to the webcams, whether it's to ski resorts or to go parking and say, should I go there or go somewhere else so they don't waste their time driving up there? And also the sheriff would probably like to have that. <laughs> Alright, and uh, another um, perhaps incendiary question. What's your position on the state of Jefferson? <laughs> yeah. I'll wait for the 55 second mark. <laughs> So it's a quick thumbs up, and it's sad that I have to do that because we need to return California to a Republic of California. If it was, we wouldn't have to have that discussion. 
uh, if we understand what a republic is, nothing uh, be a comparison to what we have at the national level. That's why we have a Senate, why they were there in the first place. It was democracy at the congressional level, but then it's a republic when Rhode Island said, hey, New York, you get to have everything you want. They said, okay, well, Rhode Island, you get two senators. New York, you get two senators. So it'll be a tie, and that'll be the upper chamber. So if we had something like one senator from the 58 counties, and that's the upper chamber, we'd have an equal voice with L.A. County at the upper chamber. And that's the way I would look at it. Thank you. Uh, the basic premise of the state of Jefferson is flawed from my perspective. What I have understood in conversations with proponents of the state of Jefferson is that they have a concern that we don't have fair or equal representation. And often you will hear LA has 37 representatives, we have six in Northern California. Representation, as was recently upheld by the Supreme Court, is on the per person, individual basis. The fifth district is 75% of the land mass of Placer County and a fifth of the population. Uh, this is a, a consistently strong American position that we have taken, that representation is one person, one vote. And I will tell you that Placer County would be the most wealthy county in a future state of Jefferson, and we could potentially become the deep pocket that the state of California is now subsidizing those poor northern counties. I am very concerned about that. Thank you. Um, Vehicle theft is up more than 30% in some parts of Placer County. The California Vehicle Code allows for the Board of Supervisors to increase registration fees by $1 to fight auto theft. Are you in favor of this increase? Mr. No. Supervisor Montgomery. So we already um, have a, uh, a piece of uh, legislation, if you'll call it, at, this, at uh, the county where we do impose a $1 fee. Um, we certainly could take an action to impose more under state law. Um, I doubt somehow that my board would be interested in doing that. I think we think the fee that we collect now has been very successful in uh, making sure that we do all we can to bring back those vehicles that have been stolen. And we have a very, very high return rate as well in Placer County. So we've been quite successful in using that $1. I don't think we need more. Mr. Yeah, I, I, would, I would want to look at the, the numbers uh, in a hard way, but it, I would generally agree that, it, from what I hear, that, that, that money's being used wisely. Um, it, but I don't want to be like the, the frog in the boiling pot. At some point, you know, you're just doing a little bit at a time, a little bit of heat at a time, and, and it's, next thing you know, you're, you're just up to here. At some point, you need to stop with the, the nickel nine fees. Uh, do you feel District 5 should be split into two separate districts in view of the distance and the separate interests of Tahoe versus Auburn? No, and uh, I'm glad that was brought up because I really wanted to come back on a question, two questions ago. Uh, we have a, the Assembly and the Senate are, are based on population, so that is not exactly the same way as it is with uh, our, our representation in Washington where we're supposed to have a republic, but the Senate uh, representing <coughs> districts in geography and then or states in that case and then at the congressional level representing people so the assembly is based on a popular vote as well as the Senate based on a distribution of popular vote but they just carve it up differently 40 versus 80 representatives in the Senate versus the assembly so in that regard I would leave the district alone now for those same arguments that it represents the 75,000 people roughly that it's divided into five parts and, and that's the way it is. Now, if you wanted to carve it differently, and either way, you still have to make it 75,000, so it's representing uh, one fifth of the people. Thank you. So, there's a, uh, for, for those of you who have ever been on a board of any kind, there's a structural problem with creating one more district, which is you then end up with six districts, which gives you a fantastic opportunity for a tie vote. <laughs> Probably not the best outcome. Um, for that and many other reasons, I actually think leaving the 5th District as it is makes a great deal of sense. Uh, I think Auburn and Tahoe actually have much more in common than they than divide them. Uh, many of the folks in this room I know have second homes either on Donner Summit where I live or in Tahoe. I, I think, frankly, we are a strong unified district and splitting us up would make no sense whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, job creation and job retention are important for a healthy economy. What role do you see the county taking to achieve this goal? 
So the county uh, works with each of our city partners, and we also work with uh, representatives from education, from manufacturing, from the nonprofit world on our economic development board. We recently had an economic development breakfast uh, that highlighted uh, manufacturing and things made in Placer County. And we are very, very fortunate that that board working together uh, has done a really terrific job of focusing on how we enable our existing businesses to be more successful and how we bring new businesses into Placer County. Uh, I, I think, frankly, our focus on education and working with the uh, educators in Placer County has been a really critical part of that. And our success in bringing Warwick University, uh, CSU Sacramento, and others to this area is just going to amplify all of that. Well, I think it, to make the short answer to this, the question you'd also have to ask is what's the role of government in a free market society? So how much do we need to step in? And that said, certainly we need to have some economic development plans, and we do. I think we need to be a little more seamless in the municipalities and Placer County government in their economic development plans. Uh, witness the Costco situation where we have lawsuits. I think we could have avoided some of those if we were in better transparency and communication and had a, a more uh, in-step uh, economic development plans together. And then we also have to consider removing things that can be negative to our economy, such as the homelessness. As that continues to grow, now we start talking to people outside and distal uh, to the county and coming in, and they're, they're already hearing about the homeless people from out of state are hearing about Auburn and uh, where they're welcome. So I think that's uh, uh, going to be an impediment to economic growth. Thank you. What is the greatest threat to the county and what will you do about it? Well, I think I just mentioned one of them. <laughs> so it keeps coming back to that one. So we have an issue with, uh, with the homelessness. That's one of the threats. Uh, there are several small ones, and as you go to different regions across this wide geography, as Jennifer knows firsthand as well, that uh, there's not one major issue necessarily, but there are pockets of, of uh, interest. When you go to Tahoe, a lot, a lot of them are concerned about the homelessness, even though a lot of their tax dollars go down here. If you come down here, it's a different issue than what they're, they're interested in Tahoe. Um, so I think uh, uh, that... that <coughs> We just need to, I think I already addressed some of that in the previous ones anyways with the, with the homelessness issue, but also we have some concerns about uh, fire, for example. Uh, that's when you get more distal. The municipalities are pretty good, Roseville, uh, Auburn is taken care of, but those fire districts are in dire straits right now in terms of uh, where we're going to be in the next year or two. You're going to hear an alarm soon, and it's not just the fire alarm. I think probably the biggest issue facing Placer County is an issue that many of us are not aware of, and it is an issue that is driving the very visible homelessness that we see, and that is substance abuse. Placer County has a very, very uh, concerning underlying problem with substance abuse, both of prescription and non-prescription drugs, and a lot of the folks that we see in homelessness began on a, a path that started with substance abuse. And the, the county, and frankly not just the county, but the state and the nation, needs to take this much more seriously, do a lot more in terms of mental health counseling, a lot more in terms of making substance abuse treatment readily available for our population, and keep those folks out of homelessness. Um, as to fire, this is something that's near and dear to my heart as the wife of a firefighter. What is your position on the uh, NID Centennial Dam on the Bear River? I have a great deal of concerns about what it would mean for the local communities and the constituents of the 5th District. Um, I recently submitted a letter on the notice of preparation to NID asking them to analyze, among other things, uh, traffic flow impacts both during construction and operation, making sure that we continue to have some sort of Bear River crossing between Highway 49 and 174 for public safety response. I'm extremely concerned that if the Bear River Bridge gets inundated, that uh, we can find ourselves in very dire situations, both in terms of police response and fire response. 
Uh, very concerned about the loss of recreation. The Bear River Campground is the only campground that uh, is in this area that is available to the public at public campgrounds. And if we lose it, that is an amenity that will hit Colfax very hard economically. Yes, uh, I I agree with much of that. The, the, what the motive behind what you're saying there that, that I uh, I put a letter in myself to the NID, and of course it's really disconcerting that they even told their constituency there that uh, it doesn't matter, it's a done deal. So I don't even know why they opened up their their, their forums for us. Uh, but just so you know, it's not for political expediency. I wrote a paper in 2009 on water and energy and what to do with Southern Cal and how we can have reciprocal water. And I asked them to address that and then I, at the uh, Nevada Irrigation District as well. Of course, there's no response on that. Uh, that article that I wrote was uh, subsequently picked up by Popular Mechanics. And now what, uh, what I was suggesting to be done is being done in Texas. So Texas gets the jobs, Texas gets the water, Texas gets the energy. It sounds like three things we could use. And so there's a way you could put a balance between that and preserving the environment for people to recreate and, and raise their family as well in that area. Thank you. How, sh how should the county address the increasing uh, pension uh, requirements? Um, increasing pension requirements. Is this my question first? <laughs> 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 should I just... Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the platitudes, the Auburn Journal, they were, uh, before I became a candidate, I published a, a rather uh, thorough, if I may say so myself, uh, column on public compensation. And that is contributing also to unfunded liabilities. The more we go up now, the more it's going to cost us in the end. And I appreciate that Placer County has a plan in place that they are addressing this, they've been recognized it some years ago and has put in place some payments for this unfunded liabilities in the, in the, in the multi, hundreds of millions of dollars actually uh, in the future. So they're addressing that now for the sins of those prior to this current board, if you will. Well, I'm sounding really ingratiating here. But, uh, but uh, you know, when, when I see how much is made in the top half of Placer County employees of the 2,300 employees is making uh, the average salary is $105,000. Uh, the median income for Placer County constituencies, 56000 49000 is the average. I think there's something amiss here. Placer County has been very concerned about this particular issue, uh, certainly as long as I have been on the board and predating me on the board. Uh, some of the things that, that we have done proactively, because a lot of this is driven by state and federal law, honestly, uh, but <clears throat> some of the things we've done proactively is we actually bring new hires in at a lower compensation level and at a lower retirement level. This is something that a lot of jurisdictions have done. Placer County took that action in 2009. Uh, when we have individuals like Holly Heinzen, who just retired Chief Executive uh, Assistant CEO, our expectation is that we are not going to replace her at that level, but that we are going to bring in, you know, possibly up to two folks at a lower compensation level who can come in and backfill and maybe someday rise to that level. Uh, Michael Johnston from Cedra just retired or is retiring May 6th. Same vision for that. Thank you. Is the Lincoln sewer pipeline a mistake compounded by incompetent installation? <laughs> oh, now that's not the right question. The, the Lincoln Sewer Pipeline is not a mistake. The Lincoln Sewer Pipeline was a very, very difficult decision to make. Uh, it was a 3 2 vote on the board. But frankly, we have to make decisions for the long term, not just for the immediate future. And that is a 50 plus year uh, service that is going to go through that. Um, and frankly, 50 years from now, all of our descendants are going to be saying, thank you for having done that. The State Water Board was very, very clear that they would like to see us go to regional solutions. And uh, I, I hope that Auburn will continue to move forward with their commitment. They put some dollars into the project to reserve space. I hope that they will move forward with their commitment to actually come into that project and have their effluent flow to Lincoln as well, because it was the right decision to make. Well, it is a state-of-the-art uh, system that's, that's being built, that is built, and that we're going to hook into. <clears throat> that I agree, and actually it has to be prepared for forthcoming regulations such as pharmaceuticals. Right now you're getting a lot of water with estrogen in it, for example. 
and that has to be cleared out, and that might explain a few behaviors here for the guys, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that, and that's going to be an expense, and if we had to do it at two locations, Auburn and down there, that's going to be an expense. That's just one example of, of the, the, the foresight on that component. What I do have an issue with is, it, again, speaking of seamless de development plans, what about cost overruns? So there's about 10% building on that. And then, uh, after the deal was done, most people didn't know, including us in our neighborhood, that our, our sewer rate, uh, that's about 30 some bucks now, and it's 30 some bucks for, for Lincoln, it's gonna go up to $80 for how many years? And that was done really without our approval. So there could have been some I, better ideas set forth to how to mitigate or, and negotiate those funds out. Thank you. So this question, it, I think you've addressed this a little bit, but it's uh, important enough, let's try it again. How will you help improve the economic prosperity of the entire county? This is mine? Yes. It okay, is. excellent. Uh, as, as I said before, I, I think probably our best bet in Placer County is to give educational opportunities to our children so that they don't leave. And by giving the educational opportunities, we not only have four-year universities and beyond, but we have the jobs incubators that go with those. We have research and development that grows up around those. I, I grew up in Palo Alto, and one of the reasons we saw so much um, R&D come out of that area is Stanford University. If we have a Warwick University or a CSU Sacramento that comes in, by definition, those small startups will, will sprout like mushrooms around it, and that will offer opportunities for our children to stay <coughs> in this area, be successful, and drive Placer County's economy. So I think education is the number one factor. You know, I also don't want to see them leave. And being an educator myself and being a businessman myself, I can see both sides of this. We need to actually have them uh, educated, but then they need to find jobs. Now, what do they do when they graduate? We already have this situation right now with people who are graduating, whether it's Sierra College, Sac State, who are from here, UC Davis. They have to go back and, and get a get a two-year degree after a four-year degree to get a job. So we have to find a way to stimulate that uh, that development in our district. We need to remove barriers from growth. If you already are an existing business, how about some tax breaks to allow them to expand? How about a rapid uh, system with some exemptions in it. If someone wants to put a new stove in their restaurant, they, do they really have to wait six months to expand their business? Really, there are some regulations we need to have uh, s streamlined so that way they can get their approvals. Uh, there are other things we can do with transportation, moving people around, uh, and, and improving even public transportation for stimulating the economy, getting up and down the hill. And we'll talk about the Olympics another time. <laughs> Have the this is a recurring theme, which is obviously a great concern to the community. Have the realtors raised concerns about property values in North Auburn being affected, I assume negatively affected, by the homeless population? This one's mine. Mine, I believe. Yes. Uh, for for the, for those that I've, I've spoken with, the answer is that that is a concern. That's why I brought that up earlier. Is one of the economic development hinderers which we have to look at negatives as well as how many positives we can promote. And so that is clearly one of the areas we need to address. Uh, it's not just the homelessness. We also have people whose rates are going up because of fire uh, issues. Uh, so their insurance is going up. Uh, so it's the insurance, it's that. And now what did they hear about the, uh, the $80 uh, sewer fees? So these are all uh, negatives, and we certainly need to consider that for those who are existing here, maybe grandfather us in. Uh, not a grandfather yet, but yeah. <laughs> grandfather us in, and then think about that with the new people coming in, and then start to deal with workforce housing. I know that's a nice buzzword, but it is true, and it deals with the homeless, which gets to your point about the state and state, the smaller amount of the homeless. I have heard. Uh, Honestly, conflicting reports from realtors. I've had some realtors say that they see an impact uh, in North Auburn. I have others uh, who have told me that they, they had seen an impact. They haven't seen it rise, nor have they seen it fall particularly. Uh, not a realtor, so I don't presume to understand that market as well as a realtor does. One of the things that I do hear uh, that is a huge concern of the realtors in North Auburn is just the traffic on Highway 49 and just the absolute difficulty of getting 
from point A to point B, uh, regardless of whether there's a homeless person standing on a corner or not. Um, and so one of the things that I think we really do need to do for North Auburn is focus on improving that transportation corridor, working with Caltrans and making sure that people can actually move around in their own communities. I think the biggest disincentive to economic development in North Auburn is traffic. As an aside, the uh, Chamber's recent survey uh, addressed that specific question of accessibility on 49, and it was interesting, it was uh, somewhat schizophrenic response. About half the respondents said traffic moves too slow, we need to speed it up so people can get through town faster, and the other half said, no, we need to make it so people can get out and go into the stores and, and the like. So I think that may uh, contribute to that particular challenge. Uh, again, on homelessness, in 2004, the county passed a 10-year plan to end homelessness. 2014 has come and gone. Why has the county done nothing toward a permanent solution? That is such a great question, and thank you whoever asked that. One of the very first things that happened when I got sworn in in 2009 was someone brought me that binder, ending homelessness in Placer County in 10 years from 2004. And I read through it, and to be frank, the county had done a few of the things, followed up on a few of the recommendations in that. But there had just honestly not been um, a, a, a feel that there was a need to address it, to actually grapple with it. We had been very, very fortunate as a county that our homeless population had been quite small, had been pretty much invisible. It's only really in the last, I would say, four to five years that that population has become very visible and it has become a recognized problem. But it's a recognized problem in California and in the nation. Um, and Steve just held the card up, but following up on Dr. Margot's recommendations is one of the very best things that we can do at the county to work toward reducing homelessness. Yeah, the, the war on homelessness sounds like the same people that developed the war on drugs. Uh, same success or lack thereof. But to be fair, from 2004 to, to 2014, we did have a good economy. Um, uh, 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 up to the beginning point of that, rather. And then in 2008, yes. Yeah, going back to 94. I don't know what you're all talking about. We did. <laughs> Which means I know business. <laughs> No. So, so they had, uh, but in, in 08 and 09, and then, and then it, it just boom, humble from there. Because when we first moved here too, also uh, uh, at this location 16 years ago, it, it wasn't much of a problem, it wasn't a big deal. And then about, actually more, more than 09 and 10, as Dr. Marvitz graph shows, it moved on after that. And so I, I, I'm glad we keep coming back to this, but we need to have a little bit more time to discuss some solutions. We recognize the problem, but we have to get into how can we do this as I'm writing a business plan uh, already on how to deal with this with people who are in the community to deal with their problems and to bring it down for return on investment to the community. So actually, let me just respond briefly to that. And, and let me ask you a question. In this world we live in of sound bites, and you've got 30 seconds or a minute, how do you engage the public in a more thorough analysis of really complex issues? That is uh, something that I think all of us struggle with, whether we're city council people or boards of supervisors or folks on local committees or commissions. Uh, we have a number of opportunities that we haven't had in the past. We still have traditional media, we have radio, we have newspapers, but a lot of folks just tell me they're too busy to read the newspaper or to listen to the radio. So Placer County has done a lot of work in uh, doing outreach through social media and through the internet. And I think, frankly, that is going to be the most effective way to reach out to people. Whenever possible, we do actual physical mailings, but very often people see something and literally just toss it in the bin. It, it's an enormous challenge. Don't, it, I, I don't take it lightly at all. It is an enormous challenge to educate and engage with local communities. Thank you, Mr. Was that supposed to be a 30-second soundbite from us? Or <laughs> we we'll get the minute to talk about 30 seconds? We we'll get the minute, we'll get the minute to talk about 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. Tick, tick, tick. So that is true. You need to go ahead and reach, reach out to the people that, where they're looking. Okay, a lot of people aren't looking at the newspaper. Okay, well, go ahead and, and follow them on the electronic media and other, uh, other methodologies. Uh, we certainly need to know how to get the key points out and get them the, if I said, for example, on my homeless plan, I've got seven point plan, which addresses, and then you give one, two, three, four, substance abuse, one third, uh, unemployment, one third, uh, or those third that are, full, uh, that are working, 
and can't afford a house. And you just hit some key bullet points, and that's just enough to get them interested. Ronald Reagan was really good at speaking in abstract. You have this big paper, which is what we do in science. You write this huge paper, and then you have to go and shrink it down into this abstract. And we have to learn how to do that, perhaps politically, uh, as we address the issues. And then other people say, well, that's BS. They didn't talk enough about details. Well, sometimes you're stuck with that response, but lead them to those places where they can find the information. Thank you. Thank you. What's the greatest opportunity to eliminate the rift between the county and city? Again, there's implication there, but... Is it We'll start with that. I think we're already doing it. Uh, I think the two by two conversations that we're having regularly with uh, between the city of Auburn, two, two members of the city of Auburn, two members of the Board of Supervisors, none of us wants to violate the Brown Act, let me be very clear. Um, I, think, I think just literally sitting down and having those conversations face to face are the best way that we can do that. Now we've made some uh, sort of institutional changes within the county as well to make sure, for example, that if a business is proposed out by the airport overflight path, we let the city know so that they have a timely heads up on that. But this is true not just for the city of Auburn. I do this with Colfax. I sit down every month with them. They come to my coffee. We hang out. We talk about how can we partner? What are the policies we're working on? What are the projects we're working on? How do we have a better relationship? And I'm very pleased to say that relationship is much better with both cities and the county at this point. Thank you. Okay, well, my perspective would be it isn't necessarily that much better. Now, thus, we have some lawsuits in between municipalities and counties and, and uh, you know, talk is good, it's very important, communication is good, we have the MACs, we have all kinds of groups that are working together, and certainly you need input and dialogue, <clears throat> certainly transparency as well. I think where the voters get frustrated in is where we see something going on and on and on, whether it's fire, whether it's the sewer situation, whether it's the homeless situation, where we've had and even paid for some of this dialogue, we paid for it in the way of surveys and, and studies. And so what we need to do is get to the mindset where we have people in there where we're just going to look at the data, make a decision, and then take action. There's too much distance between a lot of those steps. Thank you. What specifically will you do to, well, let's, I think that's the same question, but what specifically will you do to improve relations with the city of Auburn? Yes. Improve relations? <laughs> I think we, we've kind of hammered that one in terms of the... It was really part two of, the, of yeah. that same question. So. Oh, okay. So there's, there's, there's continuing on with the dialogue with the councils, etc., and then just moving on. So I think I answered that in terms of you get the data, uh, make a decision, take some action. Um, and we've, we've done the committees to death. It seems like there's always something. And we do need to have that. I mean, I do research all the time. That's part of my, uh, my livelihood. But we need to move on from that. That's the thing that I see uh, is, is, is missing here. People want to see some action. And it does, even inaction says something to the people of Auburn. Thank you. So in addition to the two by twos that we've reinstituted, and we reinstituted those, honestly, after the city of Auburn dropped its lawsuits, so there were no, no lawsuits pending at the moment. Uh, we we did uh, we did not with the city of Auburn. Yeah. So we did uh, have uh, uh, these regularly scheduled meetings where we sit down, two county supervisors, two members of the city council, and we talk through the issues. And we don't just talk through projects. We talk through policy. We talk through philosophy. We talk through figuring out how to create that better relationship that we all recognize has to happen. In addition to that, I sit down one on one with every single one of the city council people. Matt and I run into each other at parties and have conversations about things that are going on. Uh, Dr. Kirby and I have conversations. Daniel Berlant and I sit down and talk about fire. That relationship is being uh, cultivated and it's substantially better than it has been in the past. Speaking of fire, this question is Prop 172 funds for fire. What is your position? So Prop 172, oh God, this is one of these super wonky political questions. Uh, in 1992, 1993, and temporarily in, I believe, 2003, uh, there were these uh, pieces of legislation the state passed that took money away from counties, cities, and some local districts. In 1992, that was called the ERAF-1. 
And that had a huge impact on uh, a lot of small special districts, counties, and cities specifically. Prop 172 was a response to that. Prop 172 said, okay, we took these monies away from you. Now we are going to partially compensate you for those. So there is a small amount of money, nowhere near what the EREF took, that comes back to cities, counties, and to those special districts. Uh, the fire districts were, very briefly, the fire districts were impacted by the first EREF, but not by either of the second EREFs and we're in conversations now to figure out how to compensate those fire districts. I appreciate you only had one minute because it is a complex situation. Yeah, and what she's saying with ERAP is we're talking about education funds, just to make it clear, that were shifted, and that's why your property bills look over about two-thirds roughly is going to education. And so that the idea was uh, the public service, ambulances, uh, fire, police, sheriff, uh, even the district attorneys, the prisons, all the public safety umbrella were uh, at risk. And so the sales tax came into being, just to clarify what Prop 172 was. So it's a sales tax, and that's supposed to go to that. Now, there was a, 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 a clarification by, at the time, Attorney General Locklear, who said that those funds are totally eligible to go to the fire districts. And to date, as I understand it, none of it has gone to them. So what are we going to do? When I mentioned that alarm earlier, it wasn't just a joke. You ought to see the little fire engine that couldn't in Forest Hill get up the hill. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to rephrase this question just slightly. And uh, the question is, given your position on term limits, does that mean you will or will not be voting for Congressman McClintock? He's been in a long time. <laughs> and when did you stop beating your wife down? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just going to very clearly say that the ballot is a private choice of each of us, and that's one of the incredible things about our political system, that it's private. It is your choice who you vote for, and I am not going to tell you who I'm voting for for president or Congress, and that's, that's my choice. I encourage you all to vote for the candidate of your choice and who best represents your beliefs and your political hopes and aspirations for the country and the state and the county. Thank you. Not only do I agree that that's a personal choice, but I'll take it a step further. I will tell you, I am not going to vote for him. <laughs> Doug Lamolf is my congressman. <laughs> On the end, I have one final question which you will each recognize because it was part of the questionnaire that you received from the Chamber of Commerce. And the, the question derives from we've addressed many issues here that are easy, relatively easy, to discuss in isolation. The question is as a county supervisor, you're looking at a myriad of issues and they have to be prioritized. Given that, what are your top three priorities and what specific proposals would you make to address the priority issues? Oh, I think that was mine. So we, we've kind of highlighted the other ones. This just gives us another minute to, to talk about them. One was the fire district. Is, in my opinion, it's something swimming. I don't want to be like Will Rogers said when we got into World War II. Um, why is it that we prepare to get into a war only we're after in one? So I'd like to get a little bit ahead of the curve on that one and talk about Prop 172 money, as well as PILP money, which is payment in lieu of taxes, which $700,000 has come into the county coffers. Not one dime has been seen by Forest Hill and South Placer. So that's another obfuscation of funds. Uh, the homeless issue, we've, we've hammered. That's very uh, important, not only from the heartfelt set where we want to take care of people, okay, uh, but also, uh, we, and we want to have them employable, uh, but we also want to reduce that population, so that's a negative. And the other thing, finally, is, and it seems like it shouldn't be such a big hot-button issue, but as I look around, and you brought up the, uh, the, the traffic on 49 and 65 and such, transportation needs to be a little clearer. You ever try to look up how to get a bus from here to the mall? I mean, it's just challenging. And I take a lot of public transportation uh, from here to San Francisco, and we just need uh, a little bit better system, uh, better light timing, which we're working on, I understand, and um, uh, clear instructions how to take advantage of it and utilize it. So I think we're uh, actually very much in alignment on what the issues are, the, the most critical issues are facing the county. 
fire uh, and public safety, both response and planning and preparation, including defensible space work in our forests, homelessness, and frankly, not just addressing you know, the person you see on the corner, but addressing the underlying causes for why that person fell into homelessness in the first place, mental health, substance abuse, uh, affordable housing. We have people who cannot afford to live in Foster County, and they have grown up here, and they are working here, but they cannot afford to live here. And it's not just here in the Auburn area. Folks at the PUD in Tonto City told me they had to have an employee leave because they could not find housing. And then third, and certainly you know not insignificant, is transportation and transit, and just doing a better job of making sure that our infrastructure suits the needs of the communities. Thank you. So, and uh, with no further comment, I'd like to uh, offer the opportunity for your closing statements, and I believe that uh, Mr. Babbage goes first because we switch at the end. Well, today we've discussed the issues of the day. The question is, who do you want in the seat to address the questions of tomorrow? Who here knows what's going to be the hot button two years from now, four years from now, <coughs> perhaps even a month from now. So from that, I'm drawing, whether it's from a business background, biomedical background, perhaps using that to deal with the homeless situation as the resident PhD pharmacologist here. Uh, in my command time, it's just bringing the leadership to the table. Uh, you know, if somebody asks me, why do you want to do this? <laughs> Besides the rote answer that we can come up with. Uh, you know, I could either cure cancer, which we've been in patience with our vaccine, or try to cure government. And I think I took the harder road. <laughs> so we'll see where that bears out. So um, I wish to offer that uh, to the community. And it didn't all come easy. I think I learned as much from the hardships and the failures, as wow. some of you know, as the successes. Thank you very much. Thank you all this morning for attending. Uh, I want to just reiterate that my experience as a county supervisor over the past seven years, in addition to my small business experience, and the fact that I have lived in both urban and rural environments, really uniquely situates me for responding to the needs of the 5th District, both here in Auburn and in very remote communities like Iowa Hill. And the, the role of a county supervisor, as I see it, is to serve the needs of the constituency and to be responsive to your individual issues, problems, wants, and desires in alignment with county policy. And I think I have been extremely effective in the past seven years doing that. I think that the proof of that effectiveness is there are individuals who have been absolutely opposed to county issues such as the Walmart and the issues with the theater at DeWitt. Those individuals are my supporters and have endorsed my candidacy, showing that I can build across constituencies. I hope you vote for me on June 7th. Thank you. Thank you all for attending and thank you to uh, Steve